All right. Didn't get all your grading done, did I? I almost did. For some of you, I did. I, I made it all the way through the, the ones you guys uh, submitted on this Sunday. I made about halfway through those and the rest of the half on the other today. So some people, all the grading's done, but other people. But uh, feel free to always look at the comments. The, basically, in the comments, I just tell you what the answer is or what the part you missed was. I'll just make some comments that, you know, this. For number three, it should have been something along those lines. It should have been, you know, so if you have questions about that, feel free to respond to that reply. I get notifications for that. Or you can just email me. So today we are going to finish the organism and population ecology and evolution lecture. Do the second part of that. And so today we're really going to dig a little bit more into evolution, especially what we know about evolution. Now, evolution is kind of a funny thing. It, it, it's somewhat a, a political football, with, which is interesting. In some schools in the United States, they don't really teach evolution. Uh, depending on where you're at, but most of them do, but some of them don't. From there's some religious connotations to evolution, but uh, an interesting thing there's a guy named David Belinsky. If you ever want to listen to him, and he's got a couple books out on this. But when it comes to uh, evolution, and when we look at what we know about evolution on the scales that we can understand evolution anyway, and we look at the mutation of DNA, right, and the changes, and so on and so forth, and what happened. The thing that we have trouble uh, sort of dealing with, and we'll talk about this as we get into this lecture, is that we really don't know how one species goes from one thing to another. So for an example, how do you get, if you start out with a land roaming hippopotamus type creature, how does it end up a well in the ocean? It looks like that's what happened, but how that actually happens, we have no idea. We really have any clue about that at all. And so uh, evolution, that's why it becomes a sort of political football, because to some extent, like for an example, you guys all know about Darwin. I'm sure you've heard that name. You know that he probably went and you know, wrote some things and everyone was you know, talking about his ideas. If you read Darwin and the Evolution of Species, that's not the name of it, but if you read that, that book that he wrote about evolution, there's not a scientific claim in that whole book. Okay? It's a bunch of assertions, statements, observations, right? There's nothing science about that book at all. Um, now, that's not to say that there's a lot to be said about evolution. It certainly is. We'll get into some of them. But that's somewhat why it's political football. That if you look at evolution over time, it's over 100 million years. We don't know how those things occurred. So we, we have asserted what we think we know has happened, and again, we'll get into that and why that is. And that's why it's sort of a political football and in some places they want to be teaching it, right? Now, we're going to teach it all. We'll see what we know about it, and, and we'll take it as far as we can. But there are a lot of things that are unresolved about it. Okay, so looking at evolution and what maybe you might call something like natural selection. Now, this idea of the change through time really has, has been around for a long time. Yes, Darwin is more famous for making it popular, but like most ideas, those ideas were kicked around for a while before someone became popularized by writing about it or for whatever reason it took off socially because now it's acceptable, whatever it is. Okay. For example, that like... Uh, the uh, theory of relativity by Einstein. When he was writing all that, there was about six other individuals writing the exact same thing. And so it was sort of a race to get to who could publish it first. And in fact, there was such a race to see who could publish it first that when Einstein wasn't an English major by no means, right? So he wanted to be edited by math by people that have uh, degrees in mathematics, so on and so forth, and he was afraid someone would then take what he's all grown up and then publish it on their own or give it or sell it to one of these other people who are working on the exact same thing. So it's very common to see that. And so evolution, the idea about evolution has been around for a long time. In fact, the Greeks even talked about things like this. So it's been around for a long time. It was popularized in Darwin, and then now we've really been hitting, let's then look at this hypothesis, see if we can get explanations for it. So the original, Ideas then, and that's why I mentioned what I just did about the history of it, because these ideas of adaptation and sort of natural selection have been around 2,000 years. Okay? They've been around for a long time. That is, we know things adapt. We know things sort of change based on pressure. So natural selection, what do you think of when you think natural selection? Survival of the fittest. Yeah, that's usually what people think when you think survival of the fittest. Okay, fine, fair enough. So that, yeah, that is some of it, but for a lot of a lot of the times, it's not going to be so much survival of the fittest. It's going to be more just some meandering of the DNA that is accidental. Maybe gives something a benefit over something else, right? And that's being 
the environments change, your DNA changes, right? Those two things kind of coincide, make you a little bit more powerful. So adaptations, inherited structures, right? Function behaviors give survival a reproductive advantage. And so when you go around with like these birds here with their finches and their beaks, as we mentioned before, you can adapt to certain things. Now, how did humans adapt to problems? Like, because when, when some stress comes up and humans have to deal with a new stress, what's the thing we immediately put to work to solve the issue? Homeostasis. Homeostasis, right? And well, we'll, we'll get into homeostasis. So, technology as well. So, homeostasis, technology, uh, we use our brain, basically. Right? We use our brains also to try to solve some problems. So, when something comes up, we use our brain because we evolved that organ to fix most of our problems. We're actually quite a, a gentle creature, all things compared. Right? You guys know what a gorilla can do to you? Mm -hmm. if you uh, I think Joe Rogan famously said this, right? He said, you know, gorilla, gorillas are, they're literally strong enough to grab your arms and just rip them out of your body. And gorillas are nasty dudes. They're sort of rough, right? And chimpanzees, same, same thing. From time to time, you find someone who has a chimpanzee as a pet who maybe shouldn't have it. And the, the chimp, like there was a famous case, I think, in New York where this lady had a chimpanzee that bit her face off. Oh, uh, it was the best one. Yeah, something like that. You know, animals are rough, you're right? dogs. So how easy is it to kill a dog? It is not very easy. If a dog, if your dog, your chihuahua wants to get the best of you, stay one day, you have a small little herd dog, and it decides that it just wants to make your life hell and bite you every chance it gets. Good luck, right? There's a way to deal with it. So the way we do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We miss you. Oh, there's a picture of a hippo just looking up the same as one. That's what we do. Cross breed animals, right? So, yeah, so you have animals in the real world, right? It, it's like, uh, you know, the world we live in is sort of rough, and we avoid that world. Uh, in fact, the Greeks have a term for the way we live, which is called luxus, and we use the term luxury, which means. That exact term, right? So basically, we live we live in this nice controlled environment, right? Stuff like that. And we mentioned class. But if you want to live, everything you do, and you have to try to survive those things. And humans adapt to the brain. Bears adapt their toughness, right? Gorillas are just silverbacks and just crazy, insane, aggressive, right? And that's how they manage their problems, right? So we all have different adaptations in, way, in ways that we try to deal with things. There are different species that have different ways they adapt. So natural selection, basically the most fit, or the idea is that most fit leave more offspring and therefore the adaptation becomes more common. Right? So that's the idea of natural selection. The less fit then therefore vice versa, right? Have fewer offspring and therefore whatever traits they have become less common in the population. So whoever fits the current stress in the environment the best is the people who produce the most children and therefore the children that survive, remember the survivorship we talked about last time, and therefore, their traits get passed on more than the other traits that maybe don't fit the environment so well. Okay. That's what that's trying to say. This is Darwin's finches. So these are the different finches that he saw in the Galapagos Islands. And what they then showed, and we'll look at this, is that these, these beaks actually change through time with the stresses of the resource. And then as the resources change, or maybe go back to resources that were originally there, the beaks actually went back to the same resources or to use the same resources that were there. So the thicker the beak, the bigger the nut you can break. Okay. The, the thinner the beak, the more you're either sucking on sat, uh, nectar or you're eating insects or some other thing. Okay. So you can't take this beak here and go beat open a big acorn. It's not going to happen. You're going to break your beak doing that. You need something robust like this to do that. So if all of a sudden the food source changes and the nuts that are available change and the only thing left is acorns, well, you better quickly get one of those. Because if you don't, life's going to be difficult. Now... It's not so much, or the change that you see when we look at evolution isn't so much that like some change happens and then something dies. Typically what it is, the food source puts a stress on you, you're not able to get full, uh, let's say, food resources, and what, what, might, what might happen there? What might negative thing might happen if you can't get, let's say, a totality of resources? You get some, but not all. What might happen to you that's negative? So yeah, I can eat oatmeal every morning like I do, but that's all I'm going to get all day long until the next day. Nutrients. Yeah, and my nutrients going to go down. My nutrients go down. Then what happens? What's what going to follow directly from that if I don't eat properly? Illness. I'm going to get illness. I'm going to get sick, right? And then I'm going to die. 
if we continue to develop that for fruition. So if I don't get the proper nutrition, sooner or later I'm going to die. The stresses are going to be too much, I'm going to die. What about kids if they don't get proper nutrition? It's 10 times worse for kids, right? Kids need a lot of things because they're developing. Uh, and so if you don't provide them with enough food and you don't have the resource available to you to provide your children with food, they become sickly very, very fast when they're malnutrition. And the, like one of the number one killers today is still malnutrition of children, right? It's still one of the number one killers of kids today. So nutrition is a big deal. And again, it doesn't mean your, your nutrition was stripped completely from you. It just means you can have some disruption like the birds we saw. Maybe just one of the food resources goes to the, it goes away the dodo and disappears. And so yes, there's some left, but it's not a totality of what you needed. And so now life's gonna become a little bit more difficult and you better adapt fast. But if you don't, right, every, everyone else maybe is doing better than you and therefore you're gonna have some problems. Okay, so when we look at, let's say, how quick evolution can occur, that's what this slide sort of gets at, is biological evolution may occur rapidly. So when they looked at Darwin's finches, as these bottom two bullet points talk about, droughts cause sort of rapid escalation in evolution in the finches. So the Galapagos Islands does have droughts, depending on the time of year and some certain other factors. So when those droughts come, the food resource immediately changes. So that, that food resource shifts really fast. When it does, we saw a really fast change in the finches. We're talking over like a five-year period, seven-year period, 10-year period, you would see these finches immediately start to evolve to fit the stresses in that environment. Then when the rains returned or when you got the, the food resources back, the finches started to evolve back to their original beak shapes or body shapes or feather colors, whatever it was. Okay. So they immediately started shifting back. So the source of this sort of natural variation of these stresses mainly is by mutation of your DNA. We've shown that through some studies. Uh, it's not completely understood how it happens. But changes in DNA, environmental influence, again, UV radiation, chemicals, pollution, things like that. Now, when I list those UVs, you know, chemicals and pollution, you say, okay, well, those are negative things. But if you have a negative stress, that can turn into a positive outcome in your evolution. Okay, so just because you've been exposed to something negative doesn't mean necessarily it's a negative mutation. It could be a positive mu mutation you get back from that. In fact, what they try to suggest when we get to the end of lecture today, if you think about this idea is that there is natural radiation in the environment, right, that's bombarding us all, and they think that is probably what drove a lot of the evolution through time. It's over hundreds of millions of years, critters crawling around on the ground, living in the dirt that has the radiation, that the mutation of their cells through being struck through some sort of gamma ray or whatever might have happened through radioactive decay, that some of those mutations then drove evolution in some specific direction. Because over that amount of time, well, it's a long amount of time, right? 100 million years is a long time. Now, there are things that have evolved for 300 million years for all intents and purposes. In other words, there are things on Earth that we know existed let's say 250 million years ago. And when we see fossils of them, they look exactly like the thing we see today. Okay, so it looks like they haven't changed much. I think I mentioned one, anyone know what one of them are? Like what hasn't changed really over? Yeah, like alligators. Alligators, eh, you guys haven't seen an alligator a lot? They just, they're the humorous thing. They don't blink, right? They just stay open and they don't look around. They don't have eyelids like when you go know, to the yeah, they can run pretty quick. Yeah, if you get them on, they can't run for a long time, but oh yeah, if they're on the surface, they're adult. Oh, do they? I don't know. Yeah, not that I know of, but maybe. I don't know everything about alligators. But reptiles, especially, are things that haven't evolved too much. So, like, we can see turtles today in the record that the same turtles that were 150 million, 200 million. Same turtle, right? Still moving slow, still not eating, just doing what it wants to do. Because right, that has worked for that turtle. And so the idea then is that some things don't change over time. That's difficult to deal with because then what about these you know, gamma rays that are being produced from natural radioactive decay? Does the turtle never evolve then, even being struck by natural radiation? Apparently so, right? Because it didn't change over 100 million years. Shark, same thing. Sharks have been the same pretty much through time for as long as it is. Another sort of critter that lives on the bottom of the ocean called the coelacan. And the coelacans have been around for 350 million years, something like that, and they still exist today in lower numbers than they did in the past, but they still exist today, and they look exactly like the fossils that we find today. So if they evolved, it's not been by much that they've evolved over 350 million years. So some things evolve quicker than others, other things, not so much. So they look somewhat 
random. When we look at the evolutionary changes in DNA structures and mutations, most of them look random, meaning that it doesn't look like there was some reason that the DNA decided to do X. It just did it. Now, maybe that's not true, we don't quite know that, but it looks random. Usually to humans, when something looks random, it's because we don't know the variables that cause it, and therefore to us it looks random, but there are some constraints on why it did what it did. Maybe someday we'll figure that out, and it won't look random anymore, but random isn't a good answer. So let's look at these uh, the slide real quick, or look at the images on the slide anyway to the right. So up here you see population size going through years here, and then the seed consumption in grams per meter squared. Now remember, this is the drought. So the drought is that sort of beige color you see coming down the center there. So when the drought happened, you can see the size of the seeds dropped, and you can see that the population itself and population size dropped with it. So you see the immediate stress. Now whether that's causative or correlative, I don't know. What do you think? Causative or correlative? What would you guess? Remember the difference between the two? Yeah. Causative. causative, maybe? Yeah. So when, when we say causative, of course, what we mean is that when we uh, adjust one variable, the other one will adjust with it, meaning there's a direct relationship there. So when that one uh, variable gets adjusted, then the population goes down. And I would guess that that's true here, right? So when the, your amount of seeds go down, or the consumption of seeds go down, that your population is going to go down with it. You'd assume that that would be correct. Then here, the population size and then the index of increasing beak size going from the same time frame. Now, keep in mind that time frame is 75 to 78, that's three years. So within three years of a drought, look at the evolution you see in the beak size of the birds, right? So it's a really interesting finding on how fast evolution can occur. Now, again, we didn't take a bird and turn it into an alligator, but the bird did turn its beak into something else. Uh, and so that's over a three year period, and you see the average beak size basically increase as the seed consumption grams per meter cube go down, as the drought intensifies, right, you see that change in beak size. Now, Darwin didn't know any of that. He just knew they had different beaks, and he watched the finches and knew that the finches ate different seeds uh, in different ways, but the, the birds themselves could actually mate. And so he sort of put two and two together and said, it looks like they go down these different pathways and that some birds go down that pathway and they breed with one another and they eat this seed and these birds go down this pathway and they eat these seeds, right? And so therefore they evolve different types of, of uh, beaks, even though some of them can still mate. Birds are kind of a funny thing, by the way. When we started figuring out DNA structures and again, mapping the genome of humans and stuff like that, we looked at birds and thought, okay, some bird species, it's really hard to tell who's who. Seagulls are a classic example of this. There's a whole website it's a parody of trying to identify what type of seagull it is. And all he does is make fun of seagulls. And because it's just, if you're a birder, it's funny, right? If you're not a birder, you're not going to care. But the, the website is getting on a point that is the birds themselves are very difficult to know where they actually belong. If they're the, all the same species, are they actually different species? Are they, I mean, they kind of look the same. They'll, they'll be like a leg change color, and that's it. One will have a pink leg, the other one had yellow legs. Other than that, same size, same weight, same beak size, same eye colors, right? <laughs> to live in the same area, do the same things, have the same behavior, they can mate, they can breed, they can have children, the offspring are viable, right? All this stuff, but they have different leg colors. And that group with the yellow legs hangs out over here, and that group with the pink legs hangs out over here. So are they different species or not? So that was the main question they were trying to address as DNA started coming up into the prominence of identifying species. So what they did then is went around and took a bunch of DNA from birds and said, okay, let's solve this problem and try to figure out what bird is a species of a given complex X and who isn't part of that group. And all they did is made the problem worse. And so when they found out when they got all the DNA together from hundreds of bird species, they can't even tell the bird species apart. And so it was very difficult. So if you take a, a blood sample, let's say, from a bird and you get DNA from it, you're probably not going to be able to tell me what bird species that came from. It basically made the problem worse. So we have no idea. Birds are so difficult to figure out. Maybe someday we'll get a handle on it, but it looks like most of the birds we see can actually mate with one another, for the most part. The only thing that stops them from mating is some of the things we'll go over today, like behavior, right? Most times, behavior. So when we look at different types of ways that things evolve, we have directional, stabilizing, and, and disruptive, are the three main types that we've seen from a data-driven point of view. Now what we mean by this is these are just, it doesn't matter the numbers or anything, what this is doing is just trying to show you an idolized or a hypothetical situation of where you get these three different things. So in a directional selection, the entirety of your population, your sort of curve stays the same, but it shifts a given direction, right? So it shifts this way or it shifts back this way. 
Let's say that here on the x-axis, this is just beak size. So you have a given beak size, something happens, things start to evolve, and the population of your species, the beak size starts shifting to larger and larger and larger. But the, pretty much the curve stays the same, right? Everyone's shifting, but you're just going some direction, hence direction, right? You're going a direction. Then stabilizing is where you narrow something out. You make it become more and more focused, let's say, or more specific. So you're removing the sort of extremes out here. So instead of having, let's say, a broader range of beak sizes, now we've narrowed it down to where we've constrained it. To, and within our population now, the beak size is very, uh, let's say, minimal. So instead of having beak sizes that range from 1 inch to 12 inches, now it's just 5 to 7. Okay? So you get rid of the extremes, you sort of narrowly focus it, and that's called a stabilizing selection. Funny enough, they call it a stabilizing selection, but usually when this happens, your chances of, of evolving further become actually less because you're now too focused, right? Now your population is too hyper-focused on one type of thing. Not good evolution ones. My old, uh, uh, God, I can't remember what it's called, paleontology teacher used to make fun of vegetarians in the class because he, he would make fun of the stabilizing selection and be like, look, if all you're gonna do is eat vegetables, you have narrowed this, which means you're gonna die. <laughs> you used to say something like that. But, but they, you know, it doesn't mean that necessarily. But if you narrow that, anything that narrows down your survival ability is something that can be dangerous to you, right? Whether that's beak size, uh, a selected type of food. Pandas are here in food. What's, what do pandas eat? Bamboo. Right? What about koalas? Eucalyptus? Right? And so, do pandas eat anything else? Not really, they're sort of omnivores, but they don't really eat anything else, so they've really narrowed this down. What that means is that you have one resource, and if that one resource starts going the way of the dodo, you're in trouble, right? Because you're so narrowed down in what you can eat now, it's not gonna work out for you if that food source starts to go away, and that's what's happening with the panda. Turns out pandas are notoriously difficult to get to mate. And they figured this out, actually, with pandas. So they would take a female, the female they knew, the female was in estrus, meaning in, in heat, right? And they would take a male panda and throw it in the cage with her. Say, there you go, have at it, right? And she would just ignore it. <laughs> and so they had the hardest time trying to figure out why this was. And they just, by accident, had like three male pandas in a cage once, and then realized that the female selected one of the males. And they were like, well, wait a second. Wait, a second. How that? wait, wait, wait. So they went and got more pandas and threw more male pandas in, and it turns out that, that female pandas are very, very picky. And if she only has one male to choose from, not happening. So she needs a multitude of males in order to pick from, or else she is not mating with anybody. And so in order for a female panda to mate, you have to throw in like 10 males, and then she'll happily, in estrus, pick a male and mate. But if you don't do that, she won't do that. Again, it's another narrowing factor, right? That if she would just mate with any male, right? Well, okay, well, your population would probably produce a little quicker. But for whatever reason, they don't, and so they don't do that. But that is a stabilizing thing. That, that puts them in danger, right, of <laughs> being able to have high numbers. Then you have disruptive selection, and we can use this for beak examples too, and that is if this is beak size here, maybe our resource, ch our resource changes to maybe really big nuts and really small nuts or seeds, and so then our beak sizes start to uh, divide out, start to diverge, right? So you get a bimodal curve now where either things have really, really small beaks and really, really big beaks, but maybe nothing in between. Another example of this disruptive selection is student grades. Okay? And I guarantee you this class is going to work out this way. Uh, it, it always works out this way. It's been doing that for some two decades now. So it used to be that when you had students that would come into a class like this and you would learn and you know, everyone would take the test, at the end of the semester, the grades would have some sort of bell curve distribution like this. So if that's true, and let's say this is F, right, B, C, B's and A's. Where are most people then? C's. C's. So most people are in C's. So most people are going to be in this group here, which would be our sigma one. So most people are going to statistically going to fall into the C range, which means a few people get A's, a few people get F's, right? Most people fall in C's, and you'll have some D's and D's in there as well. But much like that disruptive selection, and again, maybe we'll look at data for this as the semester comes to a close. But now our curves look something like this. So either you fail, or you get a good grade, all right? One or the other. It's typically what the curves are like now. Okay? So that's a disruptive selection, or what's called a bimodal curve, and that we have two peaks in it. So I have just as many people get Fs as I do get As. So in a given class, I'll have like 10 Fs, and I'll have 10 As. 
very, very common. And I'm not the only one. Like that, most, most people like that, most students are like that. Why, why is that? What would you hypothesize is going on there? Why isn't it just a, a curve like normal? Exhaustion. Control. Exhaustion? <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to be the tennis thing there. Maybe it's just people who, you know, don't show up and then they go online, take the quiz, they do poorly. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, col college is, Joan, you guys know this because you're doing it right now, but college is a difficult thing for most people because it's not structured. Right? It depends on your willpower to get a good grade. You're the one who has to go make the time to study, have the willpower to do that outside of class to get a good grade. And if you don't do that, chances are pretty slim, right? depending on the class size. So anyway, disruptive selection, right? That's what that is. So over time, we've seen a shift in the grades, just like over time, we see shift in other things too. Put that perspective a little bit. So we get different changes or different direction things to go in, in evolution. Now, evolution, when we talk about it, we're talking about a genetic change. So primarily what we mean is some genetic change. We really don't mean anything else. Your genetics control your functional morphology, which is your body parts and how they grow and how they function and how you use them. And so anything that's evolutionary driven is going to be genetics out of its offset. So random events alter frequency of some of those variations you're going to see. Small populations usually are susceptible or more susceptible to, gen to genetic drift. So if you have small populations in an area and you're drifting in some evolutionary direction, small populations do that faster than larger populations. Now that should make somewhat intuitive sense because if you're a small population and some mutation occurs, that means you have a small population in which to pass that genetic mutation around quite quickly. If you have a large population uh, and some group starts to mutate, right, you're still interbreeding with everyone else and so it's harder to get that mutation to go throughout the whole population. So pushing a big population in one direction is very difficult. Pushing a small population in one direction is very easy. We do this in the lab with fruit flies. So we can take fruit flies and we can feed them certain things and put stresses on them in the environment of like a closed uh, actual container. And we can basically make the fruit flies into a different fruit fly where the new ones evolve can no longer mate with the old ones they started out to be. We can do that in lab settings. So, and we, we've done that with other things too, but fruit flies are the primary example of how they do this. Short sort of gestation period, so they're easy to control, easy to feed, easy to keep alive, and easy to mutate. So there's something that we need to find to show genetic variations and how that goes to populations. Then you get also what's called the founder effect. This is genetic change from immigration of small groups. All right, so we have five fingers, or 10 fingers, sorry. Five fingers on one hand, well, four fingers on thumb, I guess. Uh, so all of a sudden, someone comes into your group and they have, you know, ten fingers on the hand, and they start breeding with everyone in the group, right? Yeah. So they breed, they have kids, and then those kids breed with other people in the group. So the next thing you know, maybe everyone doesn't have ten fingers, but maybe everyone ends up with, I don't know, seven. That would be your founder effect: is that something from the outside just came into the group and then uh, shared its DNA within that group? We see this with cockroaches and, and all sorts of different things. So you might say, well, how are the different, how, do you, how do you have different groups of the same species? Well, what happens is you can have red squirrels, for an example, and red squirrels can live on a mountain range in uh, Nevada, and then they can live on another mountain range in Nevada, but there's a huge valley dividing those two mountain ranges. So they can't easily get from one mountain range to another mountain range. So those two groups, for all intents and purposes, are independent of each other. So over time, they'll start to evolve a little bit different depending on their uh, situations and their particular situations, their environmental stresses and such. But then from time to time, you'll get someone who wanders off and ends up over with this group, from this group. What kind of starts at group A and moves over to group B, right? The other day, we were out in the field and we were, uh, you guys know what flyas are? You ever seen a desert playa? Like a big flat lake bed that's a really bright color, sort of yellowish color, and they do, they race college and living stuff. They have two mountain ranges and a big dry valley in between. If you're a squirrel, you think it's easy to get from one part of that across that playa with the, with the uh, uh, ravens and the hawks and everything else? And how fast do squirrels move? I mean, they move faster than when they're right next to you, but how fast can they run, you know, 15 miles? If they can even run 15 miles. But we were out on the playa the other day, and it was a huge playa. I think the playa itself was something like eight miles wide. And we're standing on the playa, we're doing some geology measurements. And I noticed something was moving like off in the distance, and uh, we have binoculars on, so we looked at it. It was a bighorn sheep. Just a little black, wandering off. I don't know what the hell he was doing. 
But big horn sheep typically are they walking around flies? Not usually. Big horn sheep stay in mountain range, right? That's where their protection is from cougars and from other predators, right? And so on and so forth. So they don't need to come down to flies. So what would you guess if you know anything about animals? What would you guess about that animal? What's it doing? I'm gonna assume it's a heat. And there's a good reason for that. He's probably a young teenage male. And he's trying to find ground. Because back in his old, what, what happens back in territories with the old males? What do they do to the teenage boys? You know, they either kill them, kick them out, right? Beat them up. You guys should watch goats sometimes. <laughs> they, they hit each other in the nuts. I'll, just, I'll be crude and say that. They'll be standing there, they'll be like, whack, and they'll hit him in the nuts. They go, whack, hit him in the nuts. And they're like, don't do that to each other, you know? They do weird things. They do weird things. And you know, think the other room. And so yeah, he was probably a young male who thought, you know what, my life sucks. So it's time to try to find green or something. That's what he's doing. Will he survive? <laughs> Maybe he will really not. But if he goes and finds a new group and he can find a female, he has now just cross pollinated his DNA into another group. He survives. Yeah. He might not survive. It's a rough world out there. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll survive. But we took some photos of him. But you know, when we saw him, we were looking at him with binoculars. And funny enough, as soon as I got my binoculars on, he stopped him. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so that's boundary effect, right? That's just, yeah. you know, you see that in a while sometimes. Again, going back to people who do birding. You get this crazy thing that happens, and I have friends who bird, that's why I know about them. I go out with them every now and then and do some birding. It's kind of fun, actually. But if you get a rare bird, because birds fly, which means there's not a lot of constraint on where they can and can't go outside of elevation and resources, right? And so from time to time, you'll be somewhere, and all of a sudden, a bird shows up. What the hell is that? Like, you've never even seen this bird before. So, for an example, in L.A., they had what's called a, a white-faced ibis landed in the Sepulveda Basin in L.A. They reported this on their little, uh, you know, their little blogs and stuff like that, and it just got flooded by like thousands of birders that were coming in to take pictures of this bird. Because people, maybe you can't travel much, they have what's called a, a bird list, and so they want to get as many birds as they can, species. And so they showed up to take a photo of this bird, and be like, yeah, I got him, right? I got a white face diamond now on the list. Check, right? That's on my list. But why that's important is because the bird itself doesn't normally go there, which means what's he doing? And again, you can guess at that. Maybe he's just got lost. I don't know. Right? But ibises just hang in groups like most birds do, so they have big flocks that they fly in. And there's a single white-faced ibis out in the middle of nowhere in an area that you never see these birds. And so he's probably, again, what, he, what is he probably? Probably a young male, and he's probably not having a fun time in the flock, and so he just took off. He's like, ah, I'm just going to go this way. So maybe he'll find another group to hang out with, and then again, the founder, like, he'll add what other DNA he has with him into that potential other flock that he that he uh, uh, you know, comes into if, if he doesn't die or something like that. Like that. Okay, so species are organisms that can breed and produce fertile offspring. Caveat that a little bit. If you ask any biologist what a species is, they'll laugh at you. Okay. Being able to tell what a species is is very difficult to do. It's very hard. Even you think that'd be simple. It's not. Because you can find all sorts of exceptions to this. And so it's not that easy to figure it out. But for our intensive purposes, that's what we're going with. Okay? Organisms that can breed and produce fertile offspring, or what's called viable offspring. So if you can mate, and you can have babies that can mate and have more babies, then okay, fine, we'll call you a species. Now, you do get then new species through isolation. As we've mentioned earlier, you can have scrolls on one mountain range and scrolls on another, so they're going to evolve sort of differently. And if you get a couple that roam off to another area, they're going to evolve differently. right? And so you get new species through reproductive isolation. Now, the example I'm giving with the scrolls, the isolation for those would be that you don't have anything else available to you because nobody else is around. So maybe a couple of you wander off to some mountain range, but you have no one else to mate with now. right? So you have reproductive isolation in that case. So typically you have some type of breeding barrier. Now, in the case of the scroll I just mentioned, that's geographic. right? It's just a spatial barrier. I'm over here, you're over there, so we're not breeding. Right? There's plenty of humans that live in Samoa. Most of us aren't breeding with the people in Samoa. Okay. Not because we can. We, we have planes. We can get on planes. We can go take someone in Samoa. Right? I'm sure there's an app for it somewhere. Right? You can probably 
no, no, some of them will smell it. But, but just that even with the ability to move around like that, are, you know, the chances that one of you in here are going to marry someone who actually lives in Samoa or have babies in Samoa in Samoa, very slim, right? Very small. Probably not going to happen. So geographic barriers are very important. Oceans are very large. Getting across those isn't easy. And so a lot of uh, animals are constricted by water. And then also another way that they constrict reproductive uh, or having reproduction is temporal. That is the timing at which they can breed. Okay? Now, all animals or all critters are a little bit different in this respect, meaning that there's usually some time of year at which in the animal kingdom things go into what we call heat or estrus. Okay? In other words, like deer have a, a rut season. And a rut season is where the males go out and they beat each other up and try to figure out who's king of the, of the harem, right? And whoever wins that little war, right, they're the ones who get to mate with the females. And that's a very specific time of year. It doesn't happen the rest of the year, right? And during typical springtime, typically. Why would that be during springtime? Why would that be a thing? Why would springtime be the time at which something is going to have babies? Maybe it's like just ideal to have it. Food in the sun, you can gather more food, stars, more food. Food, yeah. So it's actually food is what it is. So spring, when spring comes on in most places, especially in the Midwest and in areas like that and other places throughout the world, when spring comes on, that means there's an abundance of food, usually more than you can eat. And so animals have evolved that timing to sort of match with the availability of food because you got to feed babies. As we all know, if you have babies, it's not so easy to feed them. It takes a lot of resources to do that. So you would certainly wouldn't want to have take you wouldn't have you wouldn't want to have babies let's say in the fall or midsummer because that's when food isn't at its maximum. It may work out right. You may be able to do it, but the stresses will be more than what it would be in springtime. So deer do that. A lot of critters do that. A lot of critters have seasons. Other critters, no seasons at all. Right? Do humans have seasons? Not really. Right? Humans really don't have seasons. Is it clear? And I don't mean to be crude about this. But is it clear when a female is receptible to having a baby in humans? Not really, right? If it was, it'd be much easier on us. <laughs> I'm like, I know what you want. <laughs> You're getting out of me. I know what you want. You want a baby. No, but in humans, it's very complex, right? In humans, it's very, very complex within humans. So it's different for us than it is in other animals. But most animals have, at least most, let's say, um, in scientific animalia, most of them have some season in which they breed, and if you go outside of that breeding season, you're not going to breed with that is. So white-tailed deer breed at a very specific time and place, right? And if you're not in that time and place when they're breeding, you're going to miss out even if you could breed with them. So that's what that's trying to say, that you, you basically you could breed with them, but you don't breed at the same time, so you never have babies because you're not there during the proper time. Now the image you see here is a geographic spatial distribution. You see the northern spotted owl, the green, which is in the northwest, and then the barred owl, which is all in the southeast. Those two birds can breed, and they can have viable offspring. But what's between them? Mountains, Rocky Mountains, right? The mountain, Rocky Mountains, we're right there. So pretty much, no, not, not all of that is mountain range, but the mountain ranges are between them and the birds in the northeast, or northwest, sorry. Funny enough, some of those barred owls have now made it to the to the and are now out breeding the uh, the potted owls over there. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So, very, very untenable situation for the spotted owls. So here's a example of temporal distribution of breeding patterns. These different frog species doesn't matter what they are, but these three frog species can all interbreed or mate with one another and have viable offspring. But they typically don't. And the reason they don't is because this guy breeds in February, this guy breeds about March, April, and that guy breeds in May and June. And so even though they can breed, the timing is off, so they typically do not breed in one. So that's your temporal distribution of how some things breed. So new species, when you look at how you're going to get reproductive isolation in new species still, Again, remember I mentioned earlier, I think it was last time we were talking, that you can have courtship rituals, and if you don't know how to do the courtship, no one's going to mate with you. Humans somewhat have something like this, right? It's not necessarily a dance, but metaphorically the thing is, right? When you, when you mate someone, or when you mate someone, when you typically are weighing some up whether you want to date someone or not, you're taking all sorts of things into account, and most of those things are something that's behavioral, right? And if they act and say the wrong thing, 
and you're out the door, right? Unless you're really dead. <laughs> outside of that, you're out the door. So behavioral is, is a key in a lot of breeding relationships. Now, obviously, when we get back to very simple cell organisms, none of this thing, then bacteria don't care how other bacteria necessarily act. In some cases, they actually do. You have to like move yourself properly or else you get ignored by the rest of them. But so there is some behavioral things in there, but for the most part, uh, they don't have And then just structural. You're incapable. The nuts and bolts don't fit. Right? So even if you could actually breed, and what I mean by that is we could take sperm from that animal and an egg from that animal, we can put them together and we'll get a viable offspring. We've done that in the lab with certain species. But in the real animal kingdom, the nuts and bolts don't fit together, so they can't breed, and so they never have children. Right? They, they can't have offspring because of that. So this guy here, sort of a funny looking one, this is, this is called a blue-footed booby. That's what this guy's called. It's a whole, a whole different series of birds that are called boobies. Uh, this is a blue-footed booby. And it has this dance where it like does this thing, right, and they like, put their head down, and they do this with one another, and they do it in concordance, right, and, and that type of thing. And they've shown, and they've taken some uh, of the species that have been injured, and they can't probably do the dance and try to get them to mate, and females won't have nothing to do with it. If you can't do that dance, right, then they are out the door. The sword's been picky. So, you know, good luck. And unless you find that rare, just abnormal female who's not uh, concerned anymore about the way you dance or something, you know, your ability to have offspring is going to be greatly. Now, behavior, why might behavior be a key of something we would want to pay attention to in the animal kingdom as it comes to evolution? Why would it matter? What I'm asking is, why would we care whether someone can do the dance or not? Well, viable offspring. But why? That's true. But why? I agree, but, but let's get deeper than that. So they can survive. But why? <laughs> Why and how? So, yeah, so they need to survive, obviously. So we'll, we'll call that that they need to survive. Why would the behavior be a dictator of how you can survive? Because that's what we're saying, right? We're saying, yes, it does come back to survival. So it does, absolutely. So why does behavior then, it, why, how is behavior used as an indicator of survival? So why would the dance matter in accordance with my survival? Can we do the dance if you're healthy, right? So if, if someone is ill in the human species, you know it. Usually, usually, not all the time, but usually you know it. Something is a mess. Something's a mess. You pick that up quite quickly. Typically, when someone is ill, it's not something you look at as like, oh, that's a right? <laughs> it's not a common thing that even humans do, right? If you're ill. So one of the ways that behavior is used in the animal kingdom is it's used as an indicator that first and foremost, you're following some sort of social standard. And outside of that social standard, you're healthy enough to actually do the standard itself. So they, they show this, birds are enforcing picky about this. That's why they use them as examples. So if you go down to like the Amazonian rainforest and look at the bird species there, there's all sorts of documentaries on this because it's so unique that they produce a lot of like films about it. But birds in the rainforest, typically the females are notoriously picky about the males. Notoriously picky about the males. The males go through great extents to be able to mate with a female. And so as a general rule, who's more colorful in the Amazonian rainforest, the females or the males? The males, right? The males are like beautiful. Females usually are very uh, drobs, if I could use that term, right? They're just usually some matte color. They're brown and just you know, sort of uneventful, I guess you call compared to the males. And the males have all these bright and brilliant colors on them. And so you can ask the same color, how would that Let's say that behavioral component of them making the nest and trying to impress a female, you know, why would a female want that? And the best answer we've been able to come up with, which is not really scientific, but somewhat an explanation, a hypothesis, is that it's an indicator of how healthy you are. Like the bower bird, if you guys have ever seen the bower bird. So the bower bird collects sticks and makes it's called a bower. That's what it's called a bower bird. And so they'll clear the area around. Some, some piece of land, they'll spend exhaustive amount of time kicking out sticks and everything from this piece of property. Once they do that, then they build this structure out of sticks that looks something like this. So this sort of U-shaped bower, now it's sort of long, sort of a, like a, a, like a Tex-Mex taco shape or something. It's sort of deep. Then what they do is, in order to show this off more, they go around and they try to find the shiniest objects they can, and they put them in front of the bower. 
So they go out and they find specially things that are blue they love. And so uh, in this area where humans live, they steal things that are blue. So they'll pick, like, if you have a blue car, they'll pick at it and stuff, trying to get pieces of it off to put it out in front of this thing. Why do all that, right? Why are you doing all this? And so when they try to make sense of why something would do this sort of behavior, spend all this time making this. By the way, the males, if, they're, if there's another male over that direction and he's making his own bower, he knows when this guy's gone, he'll watch him. And when he's gone, he'll come over here and tear this thing down and go back to his own. Right? And this guy comes home, he's like, crap, and he has to rebuild this. And then he goes and tears the other guy down. And so they fight like constantly when they're trying to find these females. right? But the reason why this works, at least they think it would work from an evolutionary point of view, is that how much energy does the male have to spend to do that? Because now does he not just have to feed himself, He's got to expend an exceptional amount of energy just to build that stupid thing, right? It's not stupid, but I'll be a little bit flippant here. But he has to put all this energy into this nonsensical-looking thing. And by the way, he stands when the female standing. She, let's say, suggest she's out here. He'll stand back here with his pretty little face, right? And, like, looking down that tunnel and, like, show off. And so, like, so what? why is he doing all this? And so the explanation, again, the running explanation is the amount of energy it would take to do that is an is a example of the bird's health. If he's ill in any way, shape, or form, he shouldn't be able to do that. Right? So, and he has to be able to get enough energy and food to do this and have the time to do it, which means he can collect enough food that he has leisure time, which means he's somewhat efficient at what he does. Right? He must be by definition. Here, that is just a lot of food, right? So any you know, bower birds just don't eat it. So that's the idea. Obviously, we could probably find some arguments about that, but we're just going to go, that's the hypothesis for that, or why behavioral things would matter, why behavioral traits would matter, because they're just indicators about how healthy you are or how well you can collect food. Now, in some cases, and I can't remember if the bower bird is one of these, but in some cases, you might think it's about the collection of food, but then once they mate, the male has nothing to do with the raising of the babies. And that's true in a lot of cases. So it can't be just, oh, this guy can go get a lot of food. Right? It's more probably about just the health and the physical stamina of the DNA of that bird in particular uh, to have offspring. Right? Like, oh, he's good enough, right? And my, my children will fly someday. So that's probably more what they're doing. Now, when we look at evolution, we want to try to figure out how to classify things that have evolved into certain species and certain groups, right, that you can say, oh, all those look alike, so let's put them all in some classification. Now, the way we do that is through taxonomy. So, you guys know a snake when you see a snake. You may not know the species of snake, the name of the snake, what it eats, how it breathes, any of that stuff, but you know a snake when you see a snake. That's what this is trying to get at, is how do you then take things that have functional morphology that all look the same, and then put them together? What looks like a snake but isn't a snake? Lizard. Right? A lizard does. Is a Komodo dragon a snake? It is a reptile of sorts, right? It's not a snake. It's not a snake because what? It has legs. Do snakes have legs? Do they? So they have chromal legs that evolve that are in the body. If you kill the snake, they're, they're the bones of the legs are inside the body. <laughs> so life been a lot, yeah. Everyone's like, no, so snakes have legs, they're just inside the body. So they've evolved not to use them anymore. So it's kind of like our pinky toe, they don't use it. And so since they don't use it, it sort of goes inside their body. That's the way that they evolved anyway. And so if you look at a snake, you can Google it right now. If you want to look at a look at snake skeleton. It's like legs. Okay. There's muscles that are around the track, yes, there are, but they, it's not necessarily uh, like a purpose to use the whole thing, but they do have. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, sooner or later, they assume they're going to go away. That's it. They're going to come back <laughs> and grow their legs back. So snakes have legs inside their body that they've evolved out. So let's look at another example of that. When you look at the difference between. Let's say, I think we another good example of this. Like we were mentioning the uh, whales. Well, how do whales breathe? They breathe out of a nostril at the top of their head. That's convenient because you need the surface of the water. So if it was down here, you put something a little bit different. So it's up here. Do you think it's always there? So remember, at one point, it was a hippopotamus looking thing. Do you think it walked around with a, like a nose on its head? 
Like, no, it didn't, right? And so, it, as it went into the water, then the, do whales have Paul? So you have metal circles, you have a whole group of bones that are here. Those are called metatons. So, do whales have them? They do. Where do they have? They're flipper. And when they went back into the water, to the ocean, those evolved into fins. And so they have actual metatarsals, they have fingers, they have all that stuff, but now it's a fin instead of a paw like this, like we have like a, a hippo on the head. And so that evolutionary change is like, okay, well, what I'm trying to get at is those, the morphology of those body parts are very similar, right? But they're used differently and they look different. And so if they look different, then can we classify those different things into different groups to understand them better? And that's what we're doing. So it's not always clear cut what belongs where. Sometimes things are, are very much go down this path. It's like, okay, that's what it is. Right? Nothing can't be anything else. But in other times, it's not so clear when you're trying to classify things. And these are based off of, again, functional body parts or what's called functional morphology and body. What's the closest relative to humans? Monkeys? Chimpanzees is the exact, right? Chimpanzees is more exact. We share 99.89% of our DNA with chimpanzees. Something like that. 99.89, what it is. But of that, let's say 1% we don't share, let's just round it off to 1%. Of the 1% we don't share, something like 90% of that is junk DNA, meaning it doesn't do anything. So it's a very small amount of DNA that has made a huge difference between us and the and Z that will bite your face off. <laughs> Big difference between those things. It's a very small amount of DNA that actually makes that change. So we can know certain things about, let's say, DNA and evolution by now looking at DNA, but we can also just look at the way they're shaped and say, okay, well, uh, what's a dog then? And we can all sort of guess this, right? So what, what do dogs have that makes them a dog? Four legs. Four legs. But how many other things have four legs? Like tons of things, right? So yes, four legs, good. Check mark, but there's going to be a lot of other things too. So we have to start going down that list because a dog isn't an antelope, but they both have four legs. We all know that, right? Just being facetious, but they have canines. What do you think that term canine is? What's a canine? It's a dog. What's this? So dogs have large canines. Cats have large canines? They do though, right? So what's the difference between a cat and a dog? Dogs are nice. <laughs> so what, what's the functional morphology difference between a cat and a dog? Whiskers? No, whiskers? They won't have whiskers though, right? Sharp claws? Cats have sharp claws. claws. Do dogs have sharp claws? Yeah. Dogs do have. What's the difference? So you're right. What's the difference? Retra Sorry, she said they're they're retractable, right? They're retractable. That's the main difference. There's other ones too, but retractable is one of the main ones. That cats can retract their claws. Dogs cannot. Okay, now we're getting at something. So that's how we start getting at how we separate groups of things and whether they belong somewhere they. Belong. So what belongs closest to us? Well, chimpanzees maybe. Are cats and dogs related? Meaning, do they probably have a common ancestor? Probably, yeah, and they do. Do humans have a common ancestor with chimpanzees? Yeah, we do, right? So, so yeah, the things are going to be related like that, but but they're going to be different. We can't make the chimpanzees. Now, humans, as I mentioned before in the earliest lectures, in the earlier lectures, how long have humans been on the surface of the earth again, as as we know them? So, the Homo erectus, right, standing up, right, looking around, moving around. Two million, three million, forty-four thousand. Three million years. Oh, Jesus. That's about three million. Now, that, that's the homo species in general, which again, upright, walking on two legs. So, how do we know that then we evolved, or how do we know that anything evolved to be something different? After bones or proxies, right? We, we use some sort of proxy to be able to find maybe some sort of ancestor. And how do we do that? We do that through matching its functional morphology. 
So one of the main things you guys have probably seen is a, a sort of statue of, of uh, not statue, but a stature of skulls, and they start with like a chimpanzee or something that looks like a chimpanzee, and as they move up, they go human. And you should see the step function going, okay, it was this, then it was that, then it was that, then it was that, then it was that, and finally, sooner or later, you get a human out of that. And you can go back ad infinitum and take you back to the bacteria 3.5 billion years ago. That's the idea. Okay, that's the idea about evolution of human beings. How that evolution occurs, like I mentioned, start of class, I don't know, not sure. I'll give you the idea of what we think happens, right? Not real clear on that one, though. It's very difficult to know. Because when we look at species, even when we try to classify them like this, it's going to be very difficult to do. And I'll give you some examples of that. So this hierarchical system shows the evolutionary relationship between the species that you may be talking about. Each level includes the level below it. So what that shows, if you go all the way up to the domain, that basically, when you have a domain, that's going to include everything that's underneath it, that's within that same domain, will be the same species that belongs within that group. That's very confusing to say out loud. But if I'm, let's say, mammalia, right, if that's our, the group that we're in or the group of the species we're looking in, all mammalia are going to be classified under the eukaryotes. And what's eukaryotes again? Nucleus. The, the, yeah, the cell, the nucleus, or the multicellular critters, right? That's what eukaryotes are. If you're a very basic single cell, what's your term again? Okay. Prokaryote. So if this was a domain of prokaryote, what would be underneath it primarily? What species would be underneath there? Bacteria is very good. Bacteria, viruses, right? Stuff like that would be underneath the prokaryotes. But we're eukaryotes. Now there are some bacteria that would they're going to be underneath eukaryotes as well. But like fungus is under eukaryote. Right? Fungus is very much eukaryote type species. So then, as you go down this, then you start to see how things are going to be grouped up. Now this specific example is using a jackrabbit. The white-footed jackrabbit is what it's looking at. So when we look at eukaryotes, let's see if humans fit, and let's figure out where humans diverge from a white-footed jackrabbit. Are we similar to white-footed -foot, white jackrabbits? So in what way are we similar to that specific critter? We have ears. For mammals, we have ears, because we both have ears. Rabbits have ears, we have ears. Maybe not so big, right? But we have ears, we both have ears. What else do we do similar? Breastfeed. Breastfeed. We have milk, right? Produce milk, correct? What else? Well, not everyone does. Part of our species does, though, right? We have hair, fur. Yeah. We have hair. Yeah, yeah, we do, right? We have fur, believe it or not. Uh, I don't know. Warm blooded, cold blooded. Bones, right? So we breathe oxygen. Yes. We have lungs, so on and so forth. Right. So there's all these traits we can look at that we do, in fact relate with rabbits. So rabbits are in eukaryotes, we're in eukaryotes, but we're not the same thing. Right? So at some point we have to diverge from rabbits. So I'm just going to read the definitions, we're going to just say yes or no whether humans are going to fit this or not. The domain of eukaryotes includes all organisms with eukaryotic cells having a nucleus and membrane that are bound to organelles. Yes, that's us, right? We certainly fit in that group. Are we animalia? The kingdom of animalia or animala contains multicellular organisms that obtain energy by eating food. Most have muscles and nerves. Yes. Yeah, okay, so far so good, right? We're still an animal of some sort. Chordata, the phylum chordata includes the vertebrates. Among other shared features, they have a nerve cord extending along their backs. Very good, so we're still chordata. Again, rabbit, same thing. Rabbit still belongs here. Then mammalia is the class of warm-blooded vertebrates that have hair or fur and have females that produce milk to nourish their young. Yeah, still there, right? We're still there, so we're mammalia. Now we move into territory you guys probably haven't heard of before, logomorpha. What in the hell is logomorpha? So, rodent-like mammals with fur instead of two incisor teeth in the upper jaw. Some of us. <laughs> Some of us, maybe. <laughs> For the most part, no. So logomorpha is where we would diverge. So at the class level is all we share with rabbits. It's down to class. So you go down to Logomorpha, you end up with these rodent-like critters with uh, the incisors, right? By the way, the reason why rats and uh, rodents typically chew on everything is because their incisors continuously grow. They don't ever stop growing. So if they don't chew on things and wear those down, it'll literally kill them. So they have to chew on everything to ensure that their incisors then get them down and therefore ensure their own survival. So that's why they have this sort of nervousness about them where they chew on everything, right? Whether that's wires, your walls, your toes while you're sleeping, whatever it is. <laughs> then Leopardi, this family includes rabbits and hares having short furry tails and elongated ears and hind legs. 
again, now we're getting further and further away from rabbits, right? So we're not sharing any of these things with rabbits in Cicero. Then Lepus is rabbit relatives whose young are born with eyes open and full coat of fur. It's not the case always, right? Like, are humans born with their eyes open, eyes closed? Oh. <laughs> but our eyes are pretty much open at, right after birth, right? Uh, some species, it's not the case, right? The eyes are shut, and they're going to be—they're still uh, in a very, very, let's say, dangerous situation until those eyes open and mutinate takes it longer. You have some species, and then Lepiston soundy, right? The white-footed jackrabbit is noted for its long ears and well-developed legs. So you're just going down that list of things that we look at, and again, as you notice, these are all functional morpho uh, morphologic traits. It's just, oh, it has big ears. Oh, it has big hind legs and incisors and fur that covers its entire body and blah, 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 blah. And then you get down to what an actual rabbit is or the, the type of rabbit we're talking about. So we could do the same thing with humans. And then by the time we get down to the species level, presumably we've separated it then from every other creature that's out there once you get the species. That's why we use species a lot because by the time you get down here to species, you're talking about something specific, that, right? I'm talking about that. I'm not talking about groups of different things, right? I'm talking about something very narrow, something very specific at the species level. Now, there are subspecies levels and some other things, and we won't get too much into those. But just understand that's how we do that, right? So, that's us, right? Homo sapiens. That's our... You want to know what that term means? Say, say something. Okay, so, we are the same, right? Know thyself. So here's the best guess we have at what actually happens in long-term evolution. Again, short-time evolution, we know what happens there, we can do it in the lab, we know exactly what happens. So what we've assumed then, what the assumption is, is that if that short-term evolution runs its course over 100 million years, you can take a fruit fly and turn it into, I don't know, a hawk, right? Something like that. Because all those minor changes as you go along, Right, build up over time, build up over time, build up over time, because you end up with something that's very different from what you actually started with. Now, this is typically called microevolution and macroevolution. So those are usually the two terms you use here argued about, because macro is the more difficult one to understand, micro we understand quite well. So lack of resolution or rare fossilization of finds. So when you see those skulls lined up and you go, that skull is the precursor to that one and that one and that one and that one, when you see that, you, you get the, the common term, which is called the missing link. Meaning that, where's the, in, where, where's the interstitial of that? How many of them are there? Is there a thousand in between that skull and that skull? Three? Is there none between that skull and that skull? Right? So if I show you, an, uh, let's say, a chimpanzee skull, and I show you a human skull, well, how many steps of evolution did it take to get from there to there? Right? How many, in other words, how many species existed to get from that chimpanzee to that human being? Now, we didn't evolve from chimps. We have a common ancestor, so it's a bit of an immense number. But I'm just trying to make an argument that if you look at how evolution occurs then, well, how the hell did you get from that thing to that thing over time? So we have fossil evidence, but the problem with fossil evidence that we, that's something that we're having difficulty getting over is that fossilization is actually rare. It doesn't happen that often, meaning that you're lucky that the thing was fossilized in the first place and if you can go find it. Right? You still have to find plenty of things are fossilized. You've got to go get your hands on it. Try to figure out what it is. So let, let's just consider right now, you guys, you, you think my teaching sucks. You murder me. You drag me out into the desert. You throw me out, and then everyone leaves and forget that I'm out there. What's going to happen to my body lines? Decompose. Decompose, right? What else might happen outside of just rare, uh, the, the common just decomposition by bacteria? Eaten by what? Coyotes. Think coyotes are going to leave my body in one place? Think they're going to grab my head, tear it off, and run off with it so no one else gets to eat it? They do do that, right? Disgusting, but yeah, they do do that. Right? Do coyotes or can coyotes crack bones to get it stuff inside? Yes. So they will break by, by the time your body's been laying out there for, let's say, 50 years, it will have been decimated. What's going to be left to fossilize? And is it even going to get fossilized even if it gets buried? Because you have to bury something to fossilize it, right? So if it's no longer on the surface, first and foremost, you've got to hope that all the craters aren't going to decimate the damn thing and break it down to dust, which they will over time. Even the bacteria will destroy the bones over time. And so if that doesn't happen, well, you still need to bury it. And then once it's buried, it can't be destroyed upon burial, which often happens. And so you have to overcome that problem. Once you have it been buried then, now it still has to get fossilized to some extent. 
once it's fossilized, some human still has to come along and dig the main thing up. So it's rare, right? It's rare that we find things that are fossilized just because all those steps, and there's plenty more, but all those steps typically are, are difficult to come by in the lottery. And so if you win the lottery, congratulations, you find the T-Rex. You go, hey, now I'm rich, right? But is the T-Rex complete? Not usually, right? Not usually. So when you find a complete T-Rex or a near-complete T-Rex, you're worth a lot of money. Uh, like friend, we can dig that up on our own and sell that to the Smithsonian, right? Because they're very rare to find. And in some cases, they've actually found T-Rexes that still had lignans left from when they were alive. They had body tissue from the T-Rex they found not too long ago. Yeah. That person's rich now too. So the, the point is that it's rare, right? It doesn't happen very often. And so it's hard to figure out if you only have this skull, this skull, and this skull, and you know that they have the same functional morphologies that have been involved to understand how you got from one to get to the other into the next one, right? Into the end result. So the way we try to describe that is what's called punctuated equilibrium or philetic gradualism. You believe I just got a paper cut and drag my hand? Hurt my tail. So punctuated equilibrium is you have these step functions where you have a, a skull, you go to the next skull, and what they think is some, some dramatic evolutionary trait happened, and it happened very fast. And so you went from A to B quite quickly. Because maybe that happened, right? Because you don't have the interstitials, you only have these two things, and maybe there's a million years between the two things, but maybe the only change was really just going from this to this, and there was just some big event, and it changed fast. Or maybe there's phyletic gradualism where there's a bunch of interstitials between this guy and this guy, but we don't know where they are. We haven't found them yet, right? We haven't found them in the fossil record yet. Some, someday we'll find them or find some more of them. So those are the two arguments. Either it's something that happened quickly, or it's something that is punctuated in the fact that, or sorry, punctuated happened quickly, or something that's very gradual that just happened slowly through time, and we just haven't found the proper fossils to prove it. Because again, it's rare. So maybe that did happen, and we just haven't got our hands on those fossils. So when it comes to macroevolution, that's what this is trying to get at, is what is the rate of speciation on Earth? And it's, it's something we don't quite have a good handle on. We're getting, we're getting a good handle on it, but for the time being, it's sort of difficult to say. We don't know which one of these two is more important. And in science, we know two hypotheses like this are probably true. What's the, what's the running thing you probably should say? You have two running hypotheses, and there's no clear winner. What probably really happens in the real world then? Both. Both are probably happening. Right? Both, you probably have some punctuated things where something jumps to another species quite quickly. And then on other times, you have a very gradual process that happens depending on the species, food supply, environmental factors, et cetera. Right? So when you have two running hypotheses like that where there's evidence for both, typically what that means is that they probably both occur. Right? There's probably one that's not better than the other. Maybe they both occur simultaneously, even within the same species. Maybe they both occur. But we don't know that yet. And we'll see. But this arrow is trying to show you that, or these arrows are trying to show you the differences, the gradual one, the ones that are in the blue shade are showing you just the step function that's going along, and you're getting these gradual changes as you get to different species. And then the punctuated one is you have this, and all of a sudden, boom, you have that, and there's nothing in between, right? Some event that happened. Is that clear? Well, we know what we have. Clear as mud, anyway. Okay, with that, I think we're good. So, good luck on the exam. Make sure to take it by Saturday. Again, don't wait till Sunday when you might have a problem. Keep your book on you if you have it. Make sure your notes are sitting there, right? To help you out, so on and so forth. And uh, let me know if you have